Hello there, I'm Matt Lees, and today I'd like to talk to you about Divinity, Original Sin. It's an RPG, traditional, isometric down. Look, it, it's just, it's fucking amazing, all right? Now, do you remember games like Baldur's Gate 2 and Planescape Torment? Well, it's, it's not that good. It's not as good as those games, but it does evoke the same feelings that those games did. And frankly, that's more than enough to earn Original Sin a great big lovely kiss on the lips. But it isn't all roses, sure, there's some stuff here that is a bit wonky or just a bit annoying. Dipping your toe into lava results in sudden death, which is very frustrating when you can't quite tell the difference between fire, which just does a bit of damage, and lava, which just does a bit of death. But then many people might chalk up this lava thing as being delightfully old school, and in that vein there is at least one or two bits in the game that will murder you with very little warning, all without having the decency to throw you an autosave first. Because yes, whilst Muppets like me will infinitely fap off about the classic games of yore, it's easy to forget the genuine dark days when forgetting to save your game could lead to a tremendous an immediate loss of sanity. I thought I'd save that. I didn't, I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say, I didn't say. But it does say a lot that I'm still playing this game despite having lost about an hour of progress approximately three or four times so far. And speaking as a man who almost threw GTA 4 out of a window after failing the same mission four times, that's a pretty impressive feat. I know that throwing things out of a window is a bit of a cliche, but honestly, that was that was what I was going to do. But is it good, Matt? Is the is the inventory system good? No, it's a nightmare. Every character has their own bag of stuff, and transferring things from one person to another is like trying to juggle through a sequence of pipes. After a few hours of picking up piles of nonsense, you'll likely want to destroy everything in your backpack rather than sit and sort the bastard mess out. But that doesn't matter, because unless you're obsessively into that stuff, you don't even really need to collect that many things, on account of the economy and the world being largely fucked. Most vendors in the world, including people who specifically only sell vegetables, seem to carry vast quantities of cash and have absolutely no beef with buying stolen items. And weirdly, everyone in the world also seems to own at least one or two expensive paintings, which are frankly just asking to be quietly nicked. And you don't even need to be a skilled thief. Taking RPG logic to its illogical conclusion, you can basically just use one character to keep them talking, while you just go with the other characters and steal all of their stuff. The way you lock characters in a kind of stasis whilst talking to them in RPGs has always been weird, but this takes it to spectacular new levels. You can get people locked in this silent, perpetually patient zone while you go behind them and entirely rinse everything out of their house. But Matt, that's fucking stupid. You've broken the game's economy within about half an hour of playing. Surely that makes the game totally pointless. I know, right? But it, it doesn't, because Original Sin is a game that doesn't explicitly rely on wealth as a means of progression. And because the charm of Original Sin doesn't need traditional Pavlovian loot cycle shit to ensure that you're having a good time. You see, I'm having a good time because my first port of call in a murder investigation is for me to go and talk to any nearby chickens and sheep. I'm having a good time because the town's cheese vendor makes some of the worst puns I've ever heard on a loop forever and they're still making me smile. That excuse has more holes than a slice of this fine gorgon bear. I'm having a good time because I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know where I'm going and I've no idea what I'm going to find around the next corner. But I know that when I do find something around the next corner, it's probably gonna be something weird, like an imp playing a bagpipe made out of pigs. And while it isn't on par with all of the classics, the beauty of Original Sin is in how much you can do. For the best part of two decades, visual fidelity has ruined the RPG for one simple reason, people wanna see shit. You can't just say, oh, this happened. In the old games, back in the 90s, and obviously earlier, they used to just get away with giving you a paragraph. This has happened. Read it, you read it? That just happened. It was in the late 90s that we really had kind of gaming's 
golden age of radio in a way where you could just get away with doing all sorts of incredible things on quite a low budget just by giving you the insinuation of something having happened. In the exact same way that right now I'm going to insinuate that I'm going to take my trousers off and fade to black. Holy piss, I can't believe how hot things got when I took off my trousers. This was the golden age of the RPG, when you could fade to black and do anything. Fallout 2 was a game absolutely full of filth, but it was also a game that allowed you so many options. You could lock doors and then fill a house with grenades. Long story short, it was a great, great time because you could get away with doing anything in a game just by providing it with some writing. You only have to take a look at the insane diversity and breadth of Planescape's cast to really get a feel for where it felt Failed. like RPGs were going. Failed. These vast, Failed. sprawling, Failed. seemingly infinite worlds just full of Failed. things to absorb and Failed. look at. It was going to be amazing, but then it kind of wasn't. The ability to physically show players everything that was happening kind of made it seem by default that not showing them stuff was somehow lazy, and so things got scaled back. And when you combine that with modern game design that's kind of largely become terrified about the idea of players ever being confused or lost, what happens is you now have games that instead of giving you a huge breadth of things you can do, you're kind of left with black and white binary bollocks. Back when it first came out, Deus Ex nailed it with the way you could hack and sneak and talk or just murder your way through the whole game and see really different effects throughout. But its legacy kind of ended up being a generation of RPGs in which you could either hack or sneak or talk or murder your way through things. These clear paths set out for different play styles. The entire spectrum of choice boiled down into a handful of multiple quest markers. Are you gonna give the amulet to this guy? Or are you gonna give the amulet to this guy? or you're gonna keep it for yourself. It's quite a nice amulet, it does suit you. Now this phenomenon was most notably noticed by gamers with the finale of Mass Effect 3, but frankly, it's been the boring backbone of modern RPGs for a long, long time. Original Sin though doesn't even have a quest log, it simply has a journal. Obviously when you've wrapped something up, it'll neatly tidy itself away, but up until then, that's all you've got to work with. We've got to go and find a lighthouse. Where's the lighthouse? West. Right. And you know, as a veteran of World of Warcraft, this kind of means something. There's no swooping around, handing in quests in an optimised, carefully decided order. You know, it's a game where you explore, you poke around. You accept sometimes that you just don't know how to further that quest at the moment. So you'll just go and do some other stuff. And then if you decide at some point that you've got to get it done, and you still don't really know how to get it done, you've got options. The major questline early in the game is a murder case in which you can go around and talk to everybody and try and work out what you have to do next. But after a while, it just kind of went cold. And I'm sure there was a way to do it properly. Maybe I didn't ask the right questions to the right people. But in the end, I just sort of ended up going around breaking into people's houses and reading their diaries. And one of the nicest things about RPGs that give you systems that are malleable is it allows you to feel a bit naughty. And when I was doing this, I felt a bit naughty. I clearly was doing something, doing things in a way that I wasn't supposed to. And that's quite cool. That sounds good, man. Is it good? Well, it's almost fantastic, but it isn't quite there. You know, you've got more options about how to approach the quests, but the writing doesn't feel extensive enough to kind of prop things up properly. Original Sin uses a strict formula for dialogue, and once you've spotted how it works, some of the magic does fade. The best RPG dialogue trees allow for a sense of genuine discovery, giving you the capacity to discover brand new routes of conversation, simply through saying, it's the right things and having the right knowledge about external factors and presenting that to people in the right way. And let's not mess about here, I'm talking about Planescape because it's the best. It's the best. And on the other side of things, saying completely the wrong things should have the opposite effect, giving you less routes for dialogue 
and kind of sometimes just ultimately shutting things down. Original Sin feels overall a bit too functional, like it was built in an Excel spreadsheet. It uses a basic template that shows us choices like, here's a fictional example, choices like about your mother. So you click about your mother and this choice would lead directly to the response of a character telling you about their mother. And that response would always be the same up until you found their mother guilty of murder, at which point when having a conversation, this choice would change to this result. But then the rest of the dialogue behind that remains exactly the same, which means events in the game change specific responses with from specific characters, but rarely change the way that characters react to you, or even change who the characters are. And it's a shame because it doesn't quite do the plots justice. There are a few points in the game where you have these substantial plot revelations, and then the characters who are involved don't seem to have been shaken by them in any way. And it sadly just makes the characters feel a bit cardboard, especially when the characters jabbering voiceover loops still discusses stuff that simply isn't relevant anymore. It's like having a neighbor who complains about a barking dog, despite the fact that dog was convicted of murder and sent to jail weeks ago. And as you can see, I'm really struggling here to come up with examples that aren't explicit spoilers. So as a world that doesn't always react to your actions, and indeed the events of the story, in a way that's terribly satisfying. But it does make up for this shonkiness by being charmingly shonky in other ways. But is it good, Matt? All right, well, well, this is probably the finest example of everything that's wrong with Original Sin, but also a lot of what makes it quite great. So I've messed up this quest by making the wrong decision, and because of it, I now can't complete a different quest that sort of follows on from it. And as with real life, the best way to resolve the situation is unprovoked murder. It's unfortunate, but this man in particular needs to die. And so to save myself from being arrested, I decided to kill the chap by teleporting him away from his audience. Success! He's dead, and I didn't get arrested. But despite the fact that that man is now clearly dead, the guards watching the show continue to cheer. Which is a really flippant and odd way to respond to murder, but when that man died, he did so in a way that left his buttocks pointing comedically upwards. So yeah, it's a bit shit, but it knows that, and it does its best to absolutely entertain you at every point in the game, and that's something that sometimes games forget to do. And a major part of the entertainment here seems to be the way that the game shrugs and seemingly just encourages you to break it. If you find a locked chest and you can't open it, but you're worried you'll get caught if you smash it up, then just steal the chest, take it to the woods, and smash it up there. If you can't get across a pit of lava, then just teleport yourself across. Sure, you'll get hurt in the process, but you got across, didn't you? You can use your charismatic powers of persuasion to convince somebody to leave without a fight, and then just throw a fireball at them while they're leaving, because... Fuck it. And the combat system is flexible enough to allow you to do really cool things, especially with magic. You've got Dragon's Dogma style barrel action, which for those of you who haven't played Dragon's Dogma basically means you can pick up barrels, chuck them around and break them to get the goodness out of them. But it's even more in depth than what we saw in Dragon's Dogma. You can break a water barrel to make a puddle, then you can electrocute the puddle, or you can freeze the puddle so people run over it will fall over, or you can throw a fireball at the puddle to turn it into smoke, and then you can electrocute the smoke to make a electricity clouds. It's just there's so much stuff you can do. And even after 10, 12 hours with the game, little subtle things they've done continue to surprise me. The combat can be slow and it can often be quite hard, but because it's rooted in this really interesting tactical system, it doesn't rely heavily on abilities and loot. And when I say it doesn't rely on abilities, of course it does, but the way it works is by basically giving you a whole bunch of different skills and then letting those skills scale quite effectively. So rather than just getting a slightly better fireball and ditching your original fireball as soon as you get it, you kind of end up keeping stuff for a while. Abilities scale as you level up, and it's quite satisfying to see them gradually become more effective. 
And rather than giving you one new spell for each level of each skill, it allows you to choose which skills you learn, but stops you from learning more than a certain amount at once. Which leads to a weird kind of flexibility, like I've got a warrior who has two different spinny attacks to avoid cooldowns. In my team I've got my main lady, who sets fire to everything, I've got my main man, who makes people bleed profusely and then regenerates health whilst trampling around in their blood. And then I've got this chap who makes everything freeze and can also make it rain, which is amazingly useful. The way that all of the skills can potentially interact creates a system that's really fun to explore and discover, but also one that's quite tough to use well. And if you don't create proper strategies for your team, you can find certain members just being a bit useless. That's possibly one of my biggest criticisms of the game, really, is level progress is very slow, and if you don't put points in the right places when you build your characters, you can easily end up with people who are just a bit shit. But the final topping on the character cake is something that actually has since been patched out of the game. It was something I thought was an explicit design choice, but actually it was just something that wasn't quite finished. And while a recent patch has made it so you can switch this element off and have one of the characters controlled with an AI personality, the way I've been playing it is where you control two characters. So it's a game where you actually have two main characters and focus on the way that they interact. And this element of the game has been kept in partially because of co-op. There are puzzles that are evidently made for two people, although not in a way that's bad or irritating in single player, I should add. But also, it allows players to actually debate within the game. You think we should help this person? I don't think we should. Rather than having you actually arguing with a friend over Skype, you can actually have that conversation in the game with your characters. It's a mechanic that also reminds me of the Game of Thrones RPG, which was not so much a jewel in the rough as roughage that contained fragments of jewels. Anyway, the way you can have chat back and forth allows you to define who these characters are in a way that's quite fun. They're both tied together through a core narrative, but they can also regularly clash when it comes to making decisions. Making Original Sin one of very few RPGs that actually really feels like it counts as role-playing. Because here's the thing, video game RPGs often aren't very interesting. Stay with me, stay with me here. Because regardless of how exciting the narrative running through it and all the characters you meet in the game are, the actual core narrative of your character in most computerized RPGs is about the escalation of power, with morality that quite often boils down to economics. What's the best choice to make? Because no matter how invested we get in these stories, it's very rare that we feel like we're that man and we play like that man, because you're not. Fundamentally, I'm this man, and moral choices I'm making games tend to be pragmatic. Sure, there are occasions where I will take a stance on something. This man is particularly evil, he needs to die, these people are particularly good, they deserve a fair deal. But mostly, it's pragmatic. We make choices that feel best for us as a player, and perhaps not best for the character. This is why, in my mind, one of the best role-playing games in recent years was The Walking Dead, a game which did give your brain time to think, and so forced you to lead with your heart. But still, it's still just me making all of the decisions. Even if I try to be like those characters, it's still me, which means everything you do and everything you decide to do tends to be directly, openly, shamelessly self interested, which isn't terrible, but it doesn't make for interesting characterization. Now with traditional pen and paper, that approach just doesn't work because you can't always be focused just on yourself. You're always dealing with other people. Sure, you might have a character that dabbles between good and evil whilst trying to work out the optimal way to get the best rewards, but if you do that in a pen and paper setting, people are going to think you're a dick. Original Sin's two-character system allows you to have characters that, if you want, will always agree and happily do what you want them to do, but can also potentially argue. Now, I expect it so that my lady hero is slightly better at debating and persuasion, but I quite enjoy leaving it to chance. She thinks this, he thinks that. Let's see what happens. Now, obviously, most of this was implemented for co-op, but as a solo player, I really like it. 
He genuinely feels like the story is being driven forward by my increasingly real characters, rather than some looming invisible god obsessed with earning more gold and more power. And sure, the story isn't really that good. The characters in the game aren't that good, but they're both just good enough for me to have a really fun time. Because when I'm playing Original Sin, I suddenly feel like I'm 15 years old, sitting in my pyjamas in fixation all weekend with nothing else in the world to care about and nothing else to do. Someone else will call me down for dinner that I haven't had to make and someone else will wash my clothes and someone else will periodically come and offer me a fresh cup of tea. And that isn't all that video games can be. Video games can be much, much more than that. But sometimes, sometimes that in itself is pretty fucking good. Bye! Wow.